A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. Stave 2, The First of the Three Spirits. When Scrooge awoke, it was so dark, that, looking out of bed, he could scarcely distinguish the transparent window from the opaque walls of his chamber. He was endeavoring to pierce the darkness with his ferret eyes, when the chimes of a neighboring church clock struck twelve. Why it isn't possible, said Scrooge, that I can have slept through a whole day and far into another night, Scrooge lay and thought and thought it over and over, and could make nothing of it. The more he thought, the more perplexed he was, and the more he endeavored not to think, the more he thought. Marley's ghost bothered him exceedingly. Was it a dream or not? Scrooge lay in this state until he remembered, on a sudden, that the ghost had warned him of a visitation when the bell tolled one. He resolved to lie awake until the hour was past, and considering that he could not go to sleep, this was perhaps the wisest resolution in his power. He was more than once convinced he must have sunk into a doze unconsciously, and missed the clock. At length it broke upon his listening ear. The hour itself, said Scrooge, triumphantly, nothing else, he spoke before the hour bell sounded, which it now did with a deep, dull, hollow, melancholy one. Light flashed up in the room upon the instant, and the curtains of his bed were drawn. The curtains of his bed were drawn aside, I tell you, by a hand. Not the curtains at his feet, nor the curtains at his back, but those to which his face was addressed. The curtains of his bed were drawn aside, and Scrooge, starting up into a half-recumbent attitude, found himself face to face with the visitor who drew them. It was a strange figure, like a child, yet not so like a child as like an old man, viewed through some supernatural medium, which gave him the appearance of having receded from the view, and being diminished to a child's proportions. Its hair, which hung about its neck and down its back, was white as if with age, and yet the face had not a wrinkle in it, and the tenderest bloom was on the skin. The arms were very long and muscular, the hands the same, as if its hold were of uncommon strength. Its legs and feet, most delicately formed, were, like those upper members, bare. It wore a tunic of the purest white, and round its waist was bound a lustrous belt. The sheen of which was beautiful. It held a branch of fresh green holly in its hand, and, in singular contradiction of that wintry emblem, had its dress trimmed with summer flowers. But the strangest thing about it was, that from the crown of its head there sprung a bright clear jet of light, by which all this was visible, and which was doubtless the occasion of its using, in its duller moments, a great extinguisher for a cap, which it now held under its arm. Are you the spirit, sir, whose coming was foretold to me? asked Scrooge. I am, the voice was soft and gentle. Singularly low, as if instead of being so close beside him, it were at a distance. Who, and what are you? Scrooge demanded. I am the ghost of Christmas past, long past? inquired Scrooge, observant of its dwarfish stature. No, your past, Scrooge then made bold to inquire what business brought him there. Your welfare, said the ghost. Scrooge expressed himself much obliged, but could not help thinking that a night of unbroken rest would have been more conducive to that end. The spirit must have heard him thinking, for it said immediately. Your reclamation, then. Take heed, it put out its strong hand as it spoke, and clasped him gently by the arm. Rise, and walk with me, it would have been in vain for Scrooge to plead that the weather and the hour were not adapted to pedestrian purposes, that bed was warm and the thermometer a long way below freezing, that he was clad but lightly in his slippers, dressing gown, and nightcap, and that he had a cold upon him at the time. The grasp, though gentle as a woman's hand, was not to be resisted. He rose, but finding that the spirit made toward the window, clasped its robe in supplication. I am a mortal, Scrooge remonstrated, and liable to fall, bear but a touch of my hand there, said the spirit, laying it upon his heart, and you shall be upheld in more than this, as the words were spoken, they passed out, and stood upon an open country road, with fields on either hand. The city had entirely vanished. Not a vestige of it was to be seen. The darkness and the mist had vanished with it, for it was a clear, cold, winter day, with snow upon the ground. Good spirit, said Scrooge, clasping his hands together, as he looked about him. I was bred in this place. I was a boy here, the spirit gazed upon him mildly. Its gentle touch, though it had been light and instantaneous, appeared still present to the old man's sense of feeling. He was conscious of a thousand odors floating in the air, each one connected with a thousand thoughts, and hopes, and joys, and cares long, long, forgotten. Your lip is trembling, said the ghost. 
And what is that upon your cheek? Scrooge muttered, with an unusual catching in his voice, that it was a pimple, and begged the ghost to lead him where he would. You recollect the way? inquired the spirit. Remember it, cried Scrooge with fervor, I could walk it blindfold, strange to have forgotten it for so many years, observed the ghost. Let us go on, they walked along the road, Scrooge recognizing every gate, and post, and tree, until a little market town appeared in the distance, with its bridge, its church, and winding river. Some shaggy ponies now were seen trotting toward them with boys upon their backs, who called to other boys in country gigs and carts, driven by farmers. All these boys were in great spirits, and shouted to each other, until the broad fields were so full of merry music, that the crisp air laughed to hear it. These are but shadows of the things that have been, said the ghost. They have no consciousness of us, the jocund travelers came on, and as they came, Scrooge knew and named them every one. Why was he rejoiced beyond all bounds to see them? Why did his cold eye glisten, and his heart leap up as they went past? Why was he filled with gladness when he heard them give each other Merry Christmas, as they parted at crossroads and byways, for their several homes? What was Merry Christmas to Scrooge? Out upon Merry Christmas! What good had it ever done to him? The school is not quite deserted, said the ghost. A solitary child, neglected by his friends, is left there still, Scrooge said he knew it and he sobbed. They left the high road, by a well-remembered lane, and soon approached a mansion of dull red brick, with a little weathercock surmounted cupola, on the roof, and a bell hanging in it. It was a large house, but one of broken fortunes, for the spacious offices were little used, their walls were damp and mossy, their windows broken, and their gates decayed. Fowls clucked and strutted in the stables, and the coach houses and sheds were overrun with grass. Nor was it more retentive of its ancient state within, for entering the dreary hall, and glancing through the open doors of many rooms, they found them poorly furnished, cold, and vast. There was an earthy savor in the air, a chilly bareness in the place, which associated itself somehow with too much getting up by candle light, and not too much to eat. They went, the ghost and Scrooge, across the hall, to a door at the back of the house. It opened before them, and disclosed a long, bare, melancholy room, made barer still by lines of plain deal forms and desks. At one of these a lonely boy was reading near a feeble fire, and Scrooge sat down upon a form, and wept to see his poor forgotten self as he had used to be. I wish, Scrooge muttered, putting his hand in his pocket, and looking about him, after drying his eyes with his cuff, but it's too late now, what is the matter? asked the spirit. Nothing, said Scrooge, nothing. There was a boy singing a Christmas carol at my door last night. I should like to have given him something, that's all. The ghost smiled thoughtfully, and waved its hand, saying as it did so, let us see another Christmas. Scrooge's former self grew larger at the words, and the room became a little darker and more dirty. The panels shrunk, the windows cracked, fragments of plaster fell out of the ceiling, and the naked laths were shown instead, but how all this was brought about, Scrooge knew no more than you do. He only knew that it was quite correct, that everything had happened so, that there he was, alone again, when all the other boys had gone home for the jolly holidays. He was not reading now, but walking up and down despairingly. Scrooge looked at the ghost, and with a mournful shaking of his head, glanced anxiously toward the door. It opened, and a little girl much younger than the boy, came darting in, and putting her arms about his neck, and often kissing him, addressed him as her dear, dear brother, I have come to bring you home, dear brother, said the child, clapping her tiny hands, and bending down to laugh. To bring you home, 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 little fan, returned the boy. Yes, said the child, brimful of glee. Home, for good and all. Home, forever and ever. Father is so much kinder than he used to be, that home's like heaven. He spoke so gently to me one dear night when I was going to bed, that I was not afraid to ask him once more if you might come home, and he said yes, you should, and sent me in a coach to bring you. And you're to be a man, said the child, opening her eyes, and are never to come back here, but first, we're to be together all the Christmas long, and have the merriest time in all the world. You are quite a woman, little fan, exclaimed the boy. She clapped her hands and laughed, and tried to touch his head, but being too little, laughed again, and stood on tiptoe to embrace him. Then she began to drag him, in her childish eagerness, toward the door, and he, nothing loath to go, accompanied her. 
A terrible voice in the hall cried, Bring down Master Scrooge's box, there, and in the hall appeared the schoolmaster himself, who glared on Master Scrooge with a ferocious condescension, and threw him into a dreadful state of mind by shaking hands with him. Master Scrooge's trunk being tied on to the top of the chaise, the children bade the schoolmaster goodbye right willingly, and getting into it, drove gaily down the garden sweep, the quick wheels dashing the hoar frost and snow from off the dark leaves of the evergreens like spray. Always a delicate creature, whom a breath might have withered, said the ghost. But she had a large heart, so she had, cried Scrooge. You're right. I will not gainsay its spirit. God forbid, she died a woman, said the ghost, and had, as I think, children, one child, Scrooge returned. True, said the ghost. Your nephew, Scrooge seemed uneasy in his mind, and answered briefly, yes, although they had but that moment left the school behind them, they were now in the busy thoroughfares of a city, where shadowy passengers passed and repassed, where shadowy carts and coaches battled for the way, and all the strife and tumult of a real city were. It was made plain enough, by the dressing of the shops, that here too it was Christmas time again, but it was evening, and the streets were lighted up. The ghost stopped at a certain warehouse door, and asked Scrooge if he knew it. No it, said Scrooge. Was not I apprenticed here, they went in. At sight of an old gentleman in a Welsh wig, sitting behind such a high desk, that if he had been two inches taller he must have knocked his head against the ceiling, Scrooge cried in great excitement. Why, it's old Fezziwig. Bless his heart, it's Fezziwig alive again, old Fezziwig laid down his pen, and looked up at the clock, which pointed to the hour of seven. He rubbed his hands, adjusted his capacious waistcoat, laughed all over himself, from his shoes to his organ of benevolence, and called out in a comfortable, oily, rich, fat, jovial voice. Yo-ho, there, Ebenezer. Dick, Scrooge's former self, now grown a young man, came briskly in, accompanied by his fellow, Prentice. Dick Wilkins, to be sure, said Scrooge to the ghost. Bless me, yes. There he is. He was very much attached to me, was Dick. Poor Dick. Dear, dear, yo-ho, my boys, said Fezziwig, no more work tonight. Christmas Eve, Dick, Christmas, Ebenezer. Let's have the shutters up, cried old Fezziwig, with a sharp clap of his hands, before a man can say Jack Robinson, you wouldn't believe how those two fellows went at it. They charged into the street with the shutters, one, two, three, had them up in their places, four, five, six, barred them and pinned them, seven, eight, nine, and came back before you could have got to twelve, panting like racehorses. Hilly ho, cried old Fezziwig, skipping down from the high desk, with wonderful agility. Clear away, my lads, and let's have lots of room here, clear away. There was nothing they wouldn't have cleared away, or couldn't have cleared away, with old Fezziwig looking on. It was done in a minute. Every movable was packed off, as if it were dismissed from public life forevermore, the floor was swept and watered, the lamps were trimmed, fuel was heaped upon the fire, and the warehouse was as snug, and warm, and dry, and bright a playroom as you would desire to see upon a winter's night. In came a fiddler with a music book, and went up to the lofty desk, and made an orchestra of it, and tuned like fifty stomach aches. In came Mrs. Fezziwig, one vast substantial smile. In came the three Miss Fezziwigs, beaming and lovable. In came all the young men and women employed in the business. In came the housemaid, with her cousin, the baker. In came the cook, with her brother's particular friend, the milkman. In they all came, one after another, some shyly, some boldly, some gracefully, some awkwardly, some pushing, some pulling, in they all came, anyhow and everyhow. There were dances, and there were forfeits, and more dances, and there was cake, and there was a great piece of cold roast, and there was a great piece of cold boiled, and there were mince pies. When the clock struck eleven, this domestic ball broke up. Mr. and Mrs. Fezziwig took their stations, one on either side the door, and shaking hands with every person individually as he or she went out, wished him or her a Merry Christmas. When everybody had retired but the two apprentices they did the same to them, and thus the cheerful voices died away, and the lads were left to their beds, which were under a counter in the back shop. During the whole of this time, Scrooge had acted like a man out of his wits. His heart and soul were in the scene, and with his former self. He corroborated everything, remembered everything, enjoyed everything, and underwent the strangest agitation. It was not until now, when the 
bright faces of his former self and Dick were turned from them, that he remembered the ghost, and became conscious that it was looking full upon him, while the light upon its head burnt very clear. A small matter, said the ghost, to make these silly folks so full of gratitude, small, echoed Scrooge. The spirit signed to him to listen to the two apprentices, who were pouring out their hearts in praise of Fezziwig, and when he had done so said, Why, is it not, he has spent but a few pounds of your mortal money, three or four, perhaps. Is that so much that he deserves this praise, it isn't that, said Scrooge, heated by the remark, and speaking unconsciously like his former, not his latter self. It isn't that, spirit. He has the power to render us happy or unhappy, to make our service light or burdensome, a pleasure or a toil. Say that his power lies in words and looks, in things so slight and insignificant that it is impossible to add and count them up, what then? The happiness he gives, is quite as great as if it cost a fortune, he felt the spirit's glance, and stopped. What is the matter? asked the ghost. Nothing particular, said Scrooge. Something, I think, the ghost insisted. No, said Scrooge, no. I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now. That's all, his former self turned down the lamps as he gave utterance to the wish, and Scrooge and the ghost again stood side by side in the open air. My time grows short, observed the spirit. Quick, this was not addressed to Scrooge, or to anyone whom he could see, but it produced an immediate effect. For again Scrooge saw himself. He was older now, a man in the prime of life. His face had not the harsh and rigid lines of later years, but it had begun to wear the signs of care and avarice. There was an eager, greedy, restless motion in the eye, which showed the passion that had taken root, and where the shadow of the growing tree would fall. He was not alone, but sat by the side of a fair young girl in a morning dress, in whose eyes there were tears, which sparkled in the light that shone out of the ghost of Christmas past. It matters little, she said, softly. To you, very little. Another idol has displaced me, and if it can cheer and comfort you in time to come, as I would have tried to do, I have no just cause to grieve. What idol has displaced you? he rejoined. A golden one, this is the even-handed dealing of the world, he said. There is nothing on which it is so hard as poverty, and there is nothing it professes to condemn with such severity as the pursuit of wealth, you fear the world too much, she answered, gently. All your other hopes have merged into the hope of being beyond the chance of its sordid reproach. I have seen your nobler aspirations fall off one by one, until the master passion, gain, engrosses you. Have I not, what then, he retorted. Even if I have grown so much wiser, what then? I am not changed toward you, she shook her head. Am I, our contract is an old one. It was made when we were both poor and content to be so, until, in good season, we could improve our worldly fortune by our patient industry. You are changed. When it was made, you were another man, I was a boy, he said impatiently. Your own feeling tells you that you were not what you are, she returned. I am. That which promised happiness when we were one in heart, is fraught with misery now that we are two. How often and how keenly I have thought of this, I will not say. It is enough that I have thought of it, and can release you, have I ever sought release, in words? No never, in what then, in a changed nature, in an altered spirit, in another atmosphere of life, another hope is its great end. In everything that made my love of any worth or value in your sight. If this had never been between us, said the girl, looking mildly, but with steadiness, upon him, can even I believe that you would choose a dowerless girl, or, choosing her, do I not know that your repentance and regret would surely follow? I do, and I release you. With a full heart, for the love of him you once were, he was about to speak, but she left him and they parted. Spirit, said Scrooge, show me no more. Conduct me home. Why do you delight to torture me? I told you these were shadows of the things that have been, said the ghost. That they are what they are, do not blame me. Remove me, Scrooge exclaimed. I cannot bear it, he turned upon the ghost, and seeing that it looked upon him with a face, in which some strange way there were fragments of all the faces it had shown him, wrestled with it. Leave me, take me back, haunt me no longer, in the struggle, if that can be called a struggle in which the ghost, with no visible resistance on its own part was undisturbed by any effort of its adversary, Scrooge was conscious of being exhausted, and overcome by an irresistible drowsiness, and, further, of being in his own bedroom. He had barely time to reel to bed, before he sank into a heavy sleep.